Okay, great. Yeah, thank you for the nice introduction. Um, yeah, my name is Philip Cardiff. I'm an associate professor in University College Dublin in Ireland. Um, so I've prepared lots of slides, um, but I will try to keep you engaged for the next hour. Um, I'll see, I might try to do a little bit of hands-on, see how that works as well. This is, not my, this is not my main computer, so it was a challenge yesterday. It's an old version of Mac. I was determined to install Precise and OpenFoam and all its dependencies. And I got, I got something working. I didn't get the RBF working, something, uh, I'll, I'll ignore that, but uh, the rest of the mapping actually worked, so I was impressed with myself. Okay, so the way I'm going to structure this talk is I'm going to talk a little bit about what Solids for Foam is and then talk a little bit about how it can be connected with Precise and why you might do that and how you might do that. What is Solids for Foam? So it's an open foam toolbox for computational solid mechanics and fluid interactions. That's what it is. So it's something that sits on top of open foam and adds some extra functionality. So for example, some of my research I'm involved in is metal forming. So like large last plastic deformations of uh, ductile metals, for example, with frictional contact and things like that. So this is a benchmark case. But one of the tutorials I'll go through as well is we already saw earlier this flexible dam break uh, test case, which is uh, people use it to benchmark in, in the literature. So this is using interfoam from um, open foam and solids for foam. So um, I'd like to set this up with Precise. I think we can do that as well. There's probably some questions I can follow up uh, with the guys, the development team about that. So um, recently I migrated to GitHub as well and set up a um, website. So it's not as professional as the Precise setup, which is, is very nice. But uh, partly this was inspired by Precise. I'm like, oh, those guys have really, really nice setup. Uh, maybe I can do something like that. So uh, my case is very helpful in even talking about GitHub pages. So you can go to solidsreform.github.io and there's some basic documentation to explain a little bit about it and something about the tutorials. Um, just moving to GitHub, so I, I spent most of my time with Bitbucket. I can't remember when I started using that. I just Googled them like, which one do I use? It was like SourceForge and uh, Bitbucket and GitLab and all these other things and I didn't see the difference so I just picked Bitbucket and it was fine. There's not many things you can't do in Bitbucket that I've seen versus GitHub. GitHub seems to have a bigger user base and there's a lot more questions answered online and seems a little bit cooler and hipper as well, possibly. Um, one, one actual noticeable functionality difference is um, like build hours seem to be kind of free in GitHub, like, which I, I can't believe. I can just set my testing suite to just waste a lot of resources. Whereas Bitbucket, even with an academic count, they can be pretty limited uh, build hours uh, per minute. So that's probably one functionality. Uh, GitHub actions are kind of nice as well. Uh, so at the moment, the actions I'm using when I push a commit, it will uh, just check solves foam builds against the three main forks of open foam. Uh, so, uh, the foundation, the ESI and foam extend ch checks the builds and runs some simple tests and then pushes a build and pushes a Docker uh, image of each one of those to Docker Hub as well. And then the website will just check URLs. But I can see you definitely are very active and precise in using these actions. So there's probably, I could go through your .github uh, subfolder and see what you do there. Um, yeah, the way I do it, I'm not going really into the code, but the way I do the support, uh, which is really a pain, is through compiler directives. So every time a new release of one of the forks comes out, they just decide that they have a better way of doing something and they break backward compatibility and they say, well, the AMI interpolation doesn't need to be templated anymore, so we're going to do this now. So the way I try to support that is I use compiler directives into code. So when you go to compile solves for foam, it checks which version of OpenFoam you're using and then it will use appropriate pieces of code in, in, the, uh, in the source code solves for foam. But that could end up with spaghetti code very quickly, so I have to try figure out nice ways to support that. So for example, if you're using a, um, a temp, if you ever use a temp variable, a number of years ago, the ESI and foundation before they split introduced this dot ref if you want to reference where foam extend didn't, where you just use the operator. Uh, so that's, you'll see things like that. A brief history of solids for foam and the developments. Um, in the late 80s, was the start of the work of, on finite volume methods for solid mechanics, computational solid mechanics. And there's a guy, Demirzic, and a number of his co-workers. 
And there's various groups around the world uh, independently working on this in the early 90s. Um, related to salsa foam, the kind of history is uh, in the 90s then we had Nabla Limited. So Nabla was the company commercializing foam, the predecessor to open foam. Uh, so this is Henry Weller and Hervoy Yasek. Um, so you, if you go to the Wayback Machine, you can actually find their old website. So that link will bring you to a snapshot of their old website. And they advertise the solid mechanics um, functionality of foam. So you can you can check that out. That link. I'll, uh, sorry, I'll share these slides in, in that folder. I haven't done it yet, but I'll, I'll upload them. I'll, I'll put them on my research gate anyway. Uh, then in the 2000s, uh, you have a number of people, um, including Jasak, uh, but Vankvich, Tukovic, Karic, lots of former Yugoslavian names. Uh, so Alois Vankovic, he was, a, he was in Imperial at the time, but now he's a professor in Dublin. He supervised my PhD. This is how I was introduced to the, to the concepts. So you have Jelko Tukovic, he's in Zagreb, but he was a postdoc in Dublin at the time. And then Alexander Karach did his PhD in Imperial, but then he was a postdoc in Dublin. So this is how these connections came. So lots of different developments in the early open foam and FSI kind of came from uh, those people. I started my PhD in 2008, 2012. Uh, then, near the end of it, I shared a collection of solvers from the group called Solid Mechanics into Foam Extend. And um, because when I was starting my PhD, Alloy said, Well, we did this already. Go find this PhD student's work. And then I emailed the PhD student, and the email bounces back. And I emailed another one. He said, Well, I can't remember what I did. And then I finally get someone who sends me a folder with Solver 1, Solver 2, Solver 2, 2, Solver 3. I'm like, oh my god, this is this is a nightmare. So I tried to put at least a collection of like an FSI codes and solvers together. Um, so that led to solve mechanics. Then Jelko um, presented in Zagreb in 2014 this Extend Bazaar. So this is a kind of modular framework which solves foam is based on. It's the same uh, form as the Extend Bazaar. Uh, foam FSI, this is David uh, Blom and Delft. So unfortunately, he's not working in this area. I think he's on machine learning like everyone else now. Um, but some of the functionality uh, we took out of uh, Foam FSI, the RBF stuff was, was David's implementation. Um, but there's definitely overlaps. And then Solve for Foam, um, I think the first commit I checked was in 2016, but I can't remember when it was actually publicly available. So why? That was the what. A very random uh, way to define what, but why does it exist? So, uh, I mean, probably people already know the answer to this because you're here, but um, there's a desire to solve FSI problems, but specifically in open form. If you're using open form, you've been doing, using CFT for open form, you'll say, okay, maybe I just want to do a bit of FSI. What's the easiest way to do that? And certainly precise is, is a way to do that. Um, possibly though, if you don't want to have to learn new ecosystems, if you could just do it in open form, that would be convenient for some people, even if the functionality was limited. That, that's one of the motivations. And um, so that's kind of the desire to run solid mechanics. And then maybe there's people who want to solve just solid mechanics problems, um, not just FSI in open form. So that was kind of one of the motivations. Um, and in the solid mechanics framework, initially the open form framework, if you're familiar with it, there's a different executable for every solver. So if you want to solve an incompressible fluid solver with turbulence using a simple algorithm, there's a solver for that. And there was, could have been 80 of them at some point. So if you want an FSI solver for small strain elasticity, you have to make a solver. So there was one called ICO FSI nonlinear elastic geom something foam. So it's not, it wasn't very modular. So solver for foam was, and Extend Bazaar tried to make this modular framework. So the open foam solvers were classes um, as opposed to executables. And then separately, um, I, I'm just interested in numerical methods in general, and I'm curious about finding volume methods for solid mechanics. Um, and everybody has to have a niche in academia, so this is a nice little niche for me to, to work on. So um, that's another motivation. Why combine solids for foam precise? Yeah, so solids for foam only requires knowledge of open foam, um, but not all fluid solvers have been ported. I have to take a solver and wrap it into a new class, rewrite it, and check it didn't break anything if I want to use it with solids for foam. Whereas if I use precise, I could actually just get precise to couple a standard open foam solver with the solids for foam solid mechanics solver. That's, that's one motivation. Um, and then there's a lot of extra functionality, like say heat transfer. Otherwise, I'd have to write all that coupling, which is a pain. Um, and also, because precise is focused on coupling, naturally it may have more efficient or robust implementations than our methods, which just need to work well enough to solve our cases, if that makes sense. 
Um, so what, why, how? So how is it implemented? So the, the kind of philosophy is if you can use open foam, you can use sulfur foam. The cases look the same as open foam. It's not quite as easy as that because it seems to be in most universities, fluids and solids are two totally different things. You might, you might as well be doing different degrees. So um, people who know fluid mechanics don't necessarily know solid mechanics and vice versa. Uh, but the coding side looks, <laughs> looks the same and hopefully relatively easy to install. So if you've open foam installed, that's the biggest hurdle. I should just build on top of that with minimal dependencies. I don't know if I can continue that part. I might have to strike that out. Adding new functionality obviously requires extra dependencies. Um, emphasis on code design and style and single executable design. So I'll talk about these topics as well. So the way Solids for Foam works, unlike Open Foam, it um, has one executable called Solids for Foam with a capital F for the solver. Um, so if you look at the solver, it's just a, a shell. It just makes a pointer to a runtime selectable physics model. And the physics model, um, which is actually selected, depends on the settings in the case. So are you telling it to solve a fluid case or a solid case or an FSI case? And in an FSI case, which types of fluid and solid solvers are you using? That's the way it works. So for example, if you have a fluid model um, in open foam, you might say, I want the piezo algorithm. So I'll use piezo foam, an executable. Um, but in open foam, I, I would have ported that to piezo fluid, which is the class version. So actually in, in 2.0 now, I just ported pimple fluid because pimple is a superset of uh, simple and piezo. Uh, so I don't want to support multiple things. You just get the same functionality of, of pimple. Um, and similarly for solid mechanics, um, in solid mechanics, you kind of have two divides. You have linear geometry approaches and non-linear geometry approaches. So it's kind of like small strain, large strain. The analogy with fluids would be kind of like incompressible and compressible solvers. They're just different ways to solve the case. It's not quite the same. Um, so there's a variety of different solution algorithms within that, whether it's implicit or explicit or semi-implicit, et cetera, et cetera. Um, like in fluid models, the accuracy of your prediction often depends on how well you can predict the stress tensor, i.e. your turbulence model and choice of turbulence model and its parameters. In the same way in solid mechanics, your constitutive law or mechanical laws is the equivalent. So I'm um, trying to select which one. So we have many, many different um, types of uh, constitutive law in solid mechanics. And a lot of the popular ones are implemented for elasticity, plasticity, viscoelasticity, and then there's small strain, large strain ones. If you're into biological tissues, you have all these special hyperelastic hyper ones as well. So they're called mechanical law classes. And then the way we've implemented this FSI interface, which comes from Extend Bazaar and Jelko Tukovic, is we just have essentially Atkins and IQ ILS coupling and then fixed relaxation. These are the Richle Neumann coupling accelerated method, similar to the way FSI is done in, in precise. Um, yeah, I think the IQ and ILS implementation actually is the Grutas original one from his PhD. He actually implemented it. It's not his latest one in his latest toolbox. I haven't checked that uh, yet. Uh, curiously, I signed up for the um, CFD Direct, which is one of the forks in Open Phone. They have a newsletter every month, but this, this is, was in the most recent one. So it's the number of solvers, solver executables in Open Phone versus time chronologically. So you can see they initially had 40, then they reached a peak in 2014 at the height of the troubles, uh, <laughs> and then there was 80, and then there was spits, and now, uh, based on linear extrapolation, it looks like they're going to zero solvers uh, very soon. Uh, but I think they're aiming for one. So this is um, Open Foam Foundation. This is one of the forks of Open Foam. They, in their development branch, they've decided to follow modular, a modular structure now, which is the same as what Salter Foam uh, does. Uh, no doubt not inspired by Salter Foam uh, based on their interaction with the community. But they've decided this is better. So they're actually going to that approach. So that, this is interesting for me. Now I have to think, well, if they maybe do that better, maybe I could restructure Salter Foam around that, but then support with the other versions will be killed. So yeah, I'll continue to think about it. Just one comment on coding style. Um, a lot of people don't care about this, or they say they care, and they say, when I finish this code and it works beautifully, then I'll, I'll make it, I'll, I'll, I'll clean it up. So particularly PhD students, they'll say, I'll, I'll make it look nice later. I'm like, if it works, you're never going to have time to just sit down and clean it up. So you just either write it nice at the start or don't, don't write it nice. So, and just uh, stop lying to yourself, I suppose. Uh, so OpenFOAM has a coding style. This does not mean the code is better or works 
any more efficiently. It's just this is the way open form code should be written. If you write open form code, write it this way. Put the alignment like this. If you think it's silly, it doesn't matter. This just means that when I look at the code, I can very quickly read it. If you put a curly brace open at the end of the four and then uh, align it in with the start of the four, that's not open form style. That takes me a split second longer to read because that's not what open form looks like, even though most other conventions follow that. So read it, try to adopt it. It makes your life easier as well. And if you're asking for help on salsa foam, if you send me code that follows the style, I'll reply quicker as well. Just to note, a Clang format style uh, would be useful if someone wants to do that. I don't think one uh, is present at the moment. Installing Salsa Foam. Uh, you can do it natively or, or Docker. Natively just means you download and build a source. Um, so if you have an open phone version, fork installed, you just download it and then run the all, all make script. It uses all wmake. It uses the wmake build system of open phone. And then hopefully it just works if you have open phone installed. Um, or there's Docker as well. So I don't need to go through the details, but the current 2.0 Salsa Foam builds with Foam Extend 4.1. Uh, OpenFOAM V2012 and OpenFOAM 9. So these are three primary forks developed by three different groups that are 90% the same, maybe 95, but annoyingly different in some tedious ways. Um, yeah, these are mostly for reference. You just run the all wmake and then try Salsa Foam execut executable and see if you have it, and then you're, you're good to go. I'm going to skip over these. These are some of the Docker installation instructions, but you can find these on the website as well. Um, OK, an example solves mechanics case. So what I'm going to do now is I'll look at some example cases. I'll start with just a pure solve for foam solve mechanics case, then a pure solve for foam FSI case, and then I'll look at a precise solve for foam FSI test case, a couple of those. And then um, I haven't really structured this in a here's the features way. It's more implicitly you're going to learn about those in a problem-based sort of <laughs> manner. Uh, I don't know if that's the most efficient way, but that's the way I wrote my presentation in the airboard. Um, so at the Open Foam workshop this year was in Cambridge. So I wanted to just run a model of something to Cambridge. So Isaac Newton is a alumnus uh, of Cambridge. So I found a bust on GrabCAD and I said, oh, it'd be funny to do a simulation with that. So I, I did it. Um, so I just created a solid mechanics simulation set the properties to be kind of a low flexible rubber and then turned on gravity in the wrong direction and it wobbles around. So ah, why not? Um, so just to show how that's, uh, this is a tutorial included, so you can try this out. So in this case, I'm using Salsa Foam and Open Foam V2012, even though this should work with the other versions as well. And theory, um, yeah, so we have conservation of linear momentum in the solid. So if you're coming from a fluid background, uh, it's like the momentum equation of Nerver-Stokes, except we won't solve for velocity. You could, but it's more convenient to solve for displacement in solid mechanics formulation. And this is just assuming linear elasticity. Um, in solid for foam, there's at least four different ways you could solve these, this governing equation. Um, we could use implicit methods. That's the first three, or an explicit method. So the implicit methods the kind of standard approach, the standard open foam CFD approaches are segregated solvers. You solve, you take your coupled system and you solve in the X direction, then the Y, then the Z, and you temporarily decouple them and perform outer corrector iterations. So it's very memory efficient, but not necessarily the fastest for some problems, particularly in solid mechanics. So more recently, there are a couple solvers as well where you form a bigger system that you solve. And even more recently, I've been looking at vertex centered as opposed to cell centered methods as well, which have some curious differences, um, but they're all fine of volume. Um, just to briefly comment on some of these differences uh, in open foam, uh, predominantly it's finite volume method, but it's not open foam, it's just a toolbox. In numerical methods, toolbox. So you can implement any method. So there are finite element solvers for mesh motion, and there probably are finite difference in other methods like that. But predominantly it's finite um, volume cell centered approach. So if we were looking at a finite volume cell centered approach, we have this shaded green region, so that's your integration volume. You take the conservation equation and you try and force that over this volume. And then you do that by discretizing it in terms of unknowns at particular locations, um, which can be called nodes. 
Um, and all of these nodes make up the computational stencil. So the computational stencil is we're rewriting this equation in terms of the unknown displacement or pressure or velocity at the, at the computational stencil nodes. And, to, uh, and we're doing that to enforce the conservation equation in that highlighted control volume area. So in contrast, the vertex-centered finite volume method does the same idea, um, but typically the, the integration volume is constructed by joining cell centers or cell centers to face centers. Uh, so you construct the control volume in a different way, and then you, as a result, have a different computational stencil. If you look at the standard uh, continuous Galerican uh, finite element method, um, you would have the same stencil in this regard as a vertex-centered finite volume method, but the, the integration domain is different. So in finite element, you will take all the elements around each node um, and you enforce the equations in a volume-weighted sense. Whereas in finite volume, you will enforce it over the surface, the diversion terms over the surface of these control volumes. So the control volumes are smaller because you need computation loads outside that then. Um, also, if you look at neighboring control volumes in finite volume, they tend to not overlap, even though you can actually overlap them, it's just most people don't. Um, whereas in finite element, they do overlap, so you integrate over the same area multiple times in the finite element uh, approach. Uh, and this is the reason the continuous Galerican, the standard um, Bubnov Galerican method, the convection term is, doesn't work so well. You get oscillations in it because it's volume integration. It's not at the surface, so the mass balance isn't ensured. So this is why they have this Petrov Galerkin, SUPG, you might have seen. So this is the stand, more standard approach for CFD for finite element because you have to try and force it, uh, this conservation. So probably partly inspired by finite volume. Uh, curiously as well, um, if you look at the boundary of the domain, for vertex-centered methods, you have unknowns on the boundary. With cell centers, you don't. For fluids, it doesn't matter so much. For solids, it's a bit of a pain because you kind of want, for traction boundaries, it's, it's kind of nice to have unknowns on the boundary. So you can add them in one solver. I did add them. It's a bit of a pain because the linear system has like two parts to it. So it's a bit annoying. And then explicit versus implicit methods. It's basically taking this divergence term or these divergence terms, deciding are you going to write that in terms of unknowns or in terms of knowns at the old time. And if you do knowns at the old time, then you're limited by uh, your current number. You need to take very small steps. Or if you do it implicitly, you don't have that same current number. Um, stability, you can, it's unconditionally stable. And then within implicit, there's very many different types of implicit method. Um, if you're more, in, if you're interested in this, you can check up this paper published last year uh, by myself and Ismet Demirzic, which is a, a review of, of this area. So I started writing this paper uh, when I had no kids, and now I have two kids when it was published. So it took me some time. They were relatively close together, though. It was <laughs> maybe four years. Uh, so Ismet Demirzic, if you've ever seen his name, Ismet, one, he was one of the original guys who published in this area, but Ismet was, was the primary a uh, developer for Star CD. So Star CD was before Star CCM Plus. That was their Fortran solver. I can think you can still buy it now. I guess it's not developed anymore. So he's the original developer uh, for Star CD. So he knows his finite volumes. Okay, let's look at some cases now. So I'll, I'll look a little bit through cases here, and then I might switch over, open my terminal, see if things actually work in my terminal, open Parview, and then maybe switch back. So this is um, the case, Wobbly-Newton. So a open foam case, some of you are familiar with open foam, some of you are not. Um, the way open foam models work, um, unlike other softwares where models are typically an input file, you just have an input file, you run an executable, you read the input file. Whereas in open foam, there is an input file, but they spread it over a, a directory structure. So they make one directory, and the directory they call a case, which is your model. And then within that, it expects to find files in certain locations with certain names to define where the mesh is, where the properties are, where the boundary conditions are. So this is the approach that they adopted. So in all open from cases, you'll have a zero directory, a constant, and a system. I don't know if they're well named, but zero represents zero time. So your initial conditions and boundary conditions will be there. So if you're solving for a field called point D, point displacement, then my boundary conditions and initial conditions for point D will be there. Constant. I guess it was meant to be things that were constant, so they put the mesh folder, they call it polymesh, it's polyhedral mesh, so it's meant to be the mesh folder. Um, and 
material properties tend to be there as well. But I don't know if that makes any sense anymore now that there's dynamic meshes and things like that. But that was the original idea, I guess. And then system, these are things like numerical settings, like what schemes are using upwind or second order upwind, or what tolerances, what linear solver you're using, um, what time step you're using, adaptive time stepping, and things like that. that that's the way it works. And uh, so the sulfur foam case is just an open case, so that's how it looks. Uh, so in all the sulfur foam tutorials, I'll always have an all run and an all clean, just because even with open foam, they don't always do that. And I always, I often have to spend some time figuring out how to actually run the case. Uh, so there, I've put an all run and an all clean in all of them. So in this case, there's the primitive variable, which is the displacement vector at the points, the vertices of the mesh. So if I, I'll open up that in a second, but essentially, I have a region on my boundary called Newton. I split my Newton bust in two. I have base and Newton is the rest of it. So I'm going to say it's traction free, like zero force condition on outside of Newton. And I'm going to say zero displacement. So uniform fixed value. So it's the value for the field, this file, which is point displacement is zero on this boundary. So the point displacement is zero on, on the base. So there are the boundary conditions. And then gravity, you'll see I have a G here, which is gravity, so that's where I enable gravity. So in this case, to run this model, you can just run the all run script. But if you look inside, it makes the mesh using a mesher called Cartesian mesh. So it's like snappy hex mesh, which is a, yeah, a Cartesian mesher. It does a background grid and then cuts the surface out and then does some funky cells where it cuts out the uh, surface. So Cartesian mesh is from CF mesh or Creative Fields mesh, Franjo Jurtic in Zagreb. And then to make the patches, I have a base patch and I just map it and just say, here's where the base is. And then these are some steps just to put the mesh in the right folder because Cartesian mesh doesn't do that for me. Oh no, it's surface to patch doesn't do that for me. And then I run the solver. Um, yeah, one just note a distinction or a difference, a minor difference between a standard open foam case and a solver for foam case is because we've only one executable, you have to tell it well, what, what equations should it solve. So the way I've uh, done that in Salsa Foam is we have a physics property file here. So physics property here. And all it says is, is it a fluid or a solid or an FSI case? If it's a solid, then it will look for a directory called solid properties. If it's a fluid, it'll look for a directory called fluid properties. And if it's an FSI case, it'll look for FSI properties. And within that dictionary, it'll say, well, what type of solid is it? A, a linear geometry formulation, an implicit one, or an explicit nonlinear geometry formulation, or whatever, whatever class, solver class to actually create in memory. In this case, uh, the solid model is vertex centered linear geometry, but there's some other ones that would also work. So, linear geometry is the standard cell centered approach using a segregated solver, but there's an explicit solver. And most of them, the defaults work fine, but you can change like internal default settings for each of these models as well. And by model, I mean like a solver, essentially solving some governing equations. Yeah, just to comment on some distinction between solid models, uh, and this, this is general, this is not specific to finite volume. This is the same with finite element or any other uh, numerical method. You have geometrically linear and geometrically nonlinear approaches. Um, so geometrically linear or linear geometry assumption it's where you simplify the equations and you assume the geometry is not a function of the solution to the displacement field. So this can kind of mess people up in their understanding. You have a, an object, I apply a force on it, it deforms. So if you were making a mesh of that, you would move the mesh. But you shouldn't, you basically just say, well, I assume the mesh and the areas and volumes are not a function of the displacement field. So if the deformation is very small, that's OK. So in that case, Lagrangian and all area formulations coincide, but that can kind of confuse people as how they're not the, the same. Uh, so that's a common convention. In, Say if you open up a CAD software like SolidWorks, you do a stress analysis, it's probably doing a linear uh, geometry approach unless you specifically tell it not to. And if you don't make that assumption, if you have large deformations like biological tissues or metal forming, then you need a nonlinear geometry approach. The equations are inherently nonlinear and then you have to have some iterative solution procedure. So that they're often called finite strain or large strain approaches. That makes no simplifying assumption and then small strain is, makes a simplifying assumption. If you're not sure which one to use, try both if you get the same answer then the assumption's fine, you can use the small one, the small uh, strain assumption. If you get a different answer, then you can't. Um, but I guess there's some other rules of thumb. And then the numerical method, you can have implicit methods um, or explicit, and you can have different discardizations as well. 
And then we have the mechanical properties. That's where you specify the material law. Um, so here's a linear elastic. Uh, OK, that's only for small strains, but there's hyperelastic laws as well. You can have your Young's modulus, Poisson ratio, density, et cetera. And this is our gravity in this case. OK, let me jump over to the terminal for a little bit. Can you see that at the back? Very good. Oh, OK. This is an SSH connection. This was the one part I didn't get built. It's not too precise. This was I needed Petsy uh, installed on this old version of Mac. Uh, it didn't work. Uh, OK. It seems to be just that terminal's frozen. So I'll go from here. OK, so this is the. Oh, I don't have tree installed. OK, fine. Uh, so this is the mm, solve for foam directory. It kind of tries to follow the, the layout of the OpenFoam repository. So if you're familiar with the OpenFoam repository, you'll have a SRC folder. So these are kind of all the shared libraries between all like things to do with the mesh or material models or things like that. And then you'll have applications. And applications are like the executables. And they're broken down into solvers, which solve governing equations, and uh, utilities, which are like pre and post processing executables. So in Salsa Foam, we just have one solver called Salsa Foam, and with some utilities. And then SRC is where most of the code is. And then we have tutorials. So if I go into tutorials, NLS, um, there's fluids, solids, fluid solid interaction, and then a folder, fluid solid interaction. That's precise as well. So if I go solids, inside solids, um, we have linear elastic, hyperelastic, elastoplastic, multi-material, poor elastic, lots of elasticities. Um, also, Abacus is a commercial left finite element solver that I would often use. So you can also uh, hook up their UMATs for their material models just with appropriate Fortran bindings as well. Um, so if we go linear elastic, and then I have Wobbly Newton. I copied over the results here <laughs> just in case it didn't work. Uh, let me just clean this out. So this is our case. I'll just get rid of my old logs. So in this case, if I run the solver, solver foam. So it starts like an open foam solver, prints some stuff out. It says it's creating our runtime selectable solid model. It says you're selecting the vertex centered one, reads the mesh. In this case, it's a vertex centered solver, so it actually creates a jewel of the mesh on the fly. So it makes a separate mesh, which is the control volumes uh, mesh as well. Um, in this case, it's actually using Petsy. Most of the solvers don't use Petsy, but for this particular one, a couple of solver, I've hooked it up with Petsy. So it's using Petsy to solve the linear systems. And then this is solving in time to get Newton wobbling around the place. Um, and anything else of interest? In this case, um, I don't have the results here, but you can compare different time schemes. So in finite element uh, stress analysis, they often use Newmark beta scheme, which is kind of like a generalization of the trapezoidal rule. It's it's like the same as crank nickels and isobels and fluids, um, but you can add some dissipation. So you can try that versus second order backward versus first order backward, and you can see how it doesn't wobble anymore if you use first order backward if your time steps are too big because all your energy disappears. Um, I think I copied over the results onto this computer. So let me go there and get those solids. Uh, linear elastic, wobbly Newton. I think I have results here. Oh, there they are, results. Um, PARX is just a shortcut on my Mac just to open, uh, open um, uh, PARView. OK, so it's a little bit uh, coarse, probably coarser than the video I showed you, just because I didn't want to store a, a giant SDL in the repository. Uh, so this is the original mesh. And then you can jump through time to look at the different fields, like if I want to look at the point displacement field. Uh, but in this case, it's a static mesh formulation. So it solves for the true deformation, but it integrates it over the original mesh. So if you actually want to see the, the motion, you just have to warp it by the displacement field. So then you can see um, Isaac bobbing around. And then, of course, you can look at strain tensors or stress tensors or whatever you're interested in. So equivalent stress or the von Mises stress, uh, if it was a ductile material, that would indicate where it might yield first yield or, or start to fracture. So you can see uh, the way it's fixed at the bottom would probably fracture at the sharp edges at the bottom. 
and yeah, let me keep going. Okay, so an FSI case. This is this flexible dam brake one. So it's just the standard dam brake test case, a column of water and it collapsing, but then I just add in a little rubber uh, dam. So you have your standard Navier-Stokes uh, incompressible uh, volume of fluid formulation. This is interfoam or interdiam foam inter with a dynamic mesh capability like an ALE formulation. Um, and then I'm just using linear elastic as well. Um, and then of course, at the interface, the coupling procedure like in precise is enforcing kinematic and kinetic constraints and so on, some iterative sense. So balance of forces, balance of uh, motion. Just to comment on some of the coupling approaches, um, broadly in literature, there's partitioned approaches and then there's monolithic. Um, Salt foam at the moment are just partitioned approaches. Um, though, depending on the outcome of my many uh, grants I apply, monolithic ones, uh, uh, it's the aim to include monolithic approaches. So we have some monolithic approaches for like in Python, simple grid approaches. So it'd be nice to generalize that to sulfur foam. That's the trajectory. I'll talk in the next example, I'll just talk about some of the different partition methods within sulfur foam as well. Just a note on parallelization, this is where precise not undoubtedly scales better. And um, so the way we implemented it is we use what are called global poly batches. So we basically store the entire interface on every processor and we do a global sync on it. So that's fine if you don't have lots of cores, but if you have more than 100, I suppose that will probably not scale that well. Um, the difference, if we look at the case, it's still an open case, but we're using the region approach in um, the region uh, approach in open form. So once again, we have a zero directory constant in system, um, but within zero, we have a directory called fluid and solid. Our directory is called fluid and solid, and same in constant and same in system. So it's basically just like two cases on top of each other, a solid one and a fluid one. All the fluid bits are put in subdirectories called fluid, all the solid bits are put in subdirectories called solid. That's, and that's essentially the only difference. Um, if we go inside FSI properties, you can set the acceleration method and the different uh, like tolerances and other related settings. Um, and then, for example, if you look in the zero directory, the fluid case will have its velocity, dynamic pressure, the alpha field, the mesh motion field, just the standard fluid case for inter diam fluid case for open foam. And then in the solid, in this case, it's solving for D, which are cell-centered displacements. Um, and then, as before, the fluid will have its properties, the solids will have its properties, like mechanical properties, transport properties, turbulence properties. Um, and the same with system settings, different discardizations in each of them. So it's just two cases on top of each other, a fluid case and a solid case. In this case, to run, uh, to run this case, a block mesh is like a basic structured mesh in open foam. So you can go block mesh dash region solid, block mesh dash region fluid, so that generates the mesh in each case and then you set the initial alpha field in the fluid, and then you're on the solver. Uh, so I can quickly show that. This one should actually work on this laptop, so I don't need to use a, a, the other server. Tutorials, fluid solid interaction, Ooh, flexible dam break. So if I go, let me check my all run to check I didn't miss anything there. Yeah, one actually annoying thing, maybe you have some comments, uh, precise development team. The, there's one thing, differences between versions and the code, but then the cases are different. So I have a script called case convert. So the, I leave the cases in their foam extend version and then I go in and find differences and automatically change them. Th this won't work in general. It's only for self for foam cases. So I don't know uh, easier ways to do that other than keeping multiple copies of things which I don't want to do. So if I run my all run, um, that did all those different things. If I run solves for foam, this is it blasting through all the time steps. You can see it printing different things out as it solves the, well, you probably can't see very well, but it solves for the mesh motion of the fluid. Then it solves the alpha field of the fluid. And then it's also the velocity and the pressure, does some pressure iterations. Then it prints something out about passing uh, the forces. We're using this AMI method built into OpenFoam to pass at the interface. Then it solves a solid, prints out some residual information, and then it keeps, keeps going. Um, so then Paraview is set up to deal with multi-region cases, uh, which is nice. So if I load it in Paraview, I'll have a fluid mesh and a solid mesh. 
But if I want to display different things on different parts, I can use a filter called extract block. So if you go extract block, you can say, well, just extract the solid for this block. So that's my solid. And then you can do the same with the fluid. Side, recent, extract, block, fluid. So then I can display my alpha field and then maybe display, I don't know, the uh, hydrostatic stress in the solid or something like that. So that's my fluid. Oh, alpha water. And yeah, so then you can play and it jumps around. Let me rescale that. Oh yeah, and then because this is a non-moving mesh, then actually to see the true deformation, you need to make sure to move your solid by the displacement field as well. Okay. Oh, no. So like that. Um, so let me keep going. Okay. Okay, finally, to maybe talk about <laughs> maybe what you're waiting for. Uh, so flexible overset cylinder. So this is the first uh, test case I set up. I put it on, on the on the Salzburg Foam website. So um, there is some functionality introduced in the last couple of years in OpenFoam to do with overset meshing. I don't know how robust it is, but it definitely works for some cases if you're just careful about mass conservation. Um, basically, overset meshing, if you're not familiar, or chimera meshing is where you have disconnected regions of the mesh. So if you, you can make a nice me structured mesh around your cylinder, and then you just have a background mesh, and then the oversetting magic will do some conservative interpolation implicitly at the interface. So um, it lessens the weight of meshing, is the idea, and puts the weight onto the solver. So I took this, over, it's called overset cylinder. It's in OpenFOAM V2012 and the later versions. Um, and then I just took a little flexible donut into the center. So instead of a rigid cylinder, I have a flexible donut, and then the inside of the donut, I move with a sinusoidal uh, displacement. So I just kind of shake it around. So I made it flexible, the donut, so the donut kind of wobbles around, and then the, you have the fluid on it. So I can't do this in solver from natively because I didn't port that solver yet. Uh, and if I port it, I have to maintain it as well. So uh, this is a good example of uh, a reason to use precise. So you can see the mesh, yeah, it looks like that. So if your geometry is the same as before, uh, I use a kind of rubber for the donut, and then this is the, the loading for the displacement. I just picked a random sine curve, so I think I move it more in the vertical direction than in the x direction. So then you get something that looks like this. So it kind of wobbles around the place a little bit, and like if you stop it at, at the very start when the acceleration is highest, you see that. Uh, uh, like the donut's really squashing uh, as you're pulling it, or if it's like changing direction. Also, it's interesting for the mesh motion, so the background mesh doesn't have to move. If there, you don't need a mesh motion solver as such for that. Um, and you just have a zero gradient condition on the, this, the outside is overset patch. Um, so it's just you have like a Laplacian motion displacement solver on the inner overset region. So it makes it easier for the mesh motion solver as well. Uh, in this case, just for your reference, it's just kind of standard incompressible flow with k epsilon, and I used the segregated solver for the solid, and I was using the IQN ILS RBF mapping from Precise. I think that's kind of like the, one of the, the default ones. Just a comment on changes I had to make to the cases to get them to run. So in the fluid case, I just had to make three changes to get it compatible with Precise, so just make sure I have an appropriate interface boundary condition for you, and appropriate choice in the dynamic mesh dict and include the precise dict, so not, not too difficult. So you just have to make sure you have a moving wall velocity on your interface patch for velocity. You need to use the displacement Laplacian. I think you have to use the place, displacement Laplacian uh, solver, but that's fine, because um, uh, I think the default... Oh, in this case, it wasn't moving mesh, I guess, so it didn't make a difference. And then you added your precise um, dictionary. Then on the solid side, I only need two changes to a standard solver foam case. I need to make sure you have an appropriate displacement boundary condition and include the precise dict. So the way working with Mackie last year to get this to work in a general fashion so that precise, the open foam adapter, doesn't depend on any code in solver foam, a nice solution was we just write the forces to a generic field in open foam and then from open, or from, yeah, in open form. And then from solver form, we look for that field and copy the data. So we make it like an intermediate uh, 
vector, solid vector, or vol vector field to do it. So we made a, uh, in solid foam, I made a boundary condition called solid force. Uh, this also works with solid displacement fold, the built-in solver for open foam as well. It looks up a field called solid force, and then it expects to find a solid force field, which just has calculated for all the boundary conditions. And then precise will come in the open foam adapter and write the force values into that field, and then solid foam will look them up. So that's kind of the way it works. And then we have our precise dict as well. I, I feel as if some of these settings are no longer needed. I think uh, now the adapter actually defaults these to the correct values for the solid solver. So in this case, to run it, um, the way I was running it, I had two terminals. This was easier. I'd have one for the solid, one for the fluid. Uh, in the solid, I run block mesh, and then I rotate it by 90 degrees. The reason I do that is because it's kind of complicated the way they set up the mesh for this oversetting. It's a bit of a pain for oversetting you. They have like one case for the background mesh, one for the overset mesh, and then all these utilities to like merge them together and appropriately assign uh, cell zones and cell sets. Uh, and for some reason, they do that in one plane and then rotate the whole thing at the end. Um, but in the end, you just run solid foam on one side and over pimple diem, which is uh, this is an example of an open foam solver where you could do it a, a, a modular structure. So they've, this is an overset pimple dynamic mesh foam. So they also have pimple foam, which is an out dynamic mesh, pimple diem foam. So this is like uh, this. I can see why they want to change the modular at least one fork does. Um, yeah, out of curiosity, maybe I can check this runs here. Uh, Actually, I'm tight on time, so I'll, I'll keep uh, going. And then the last couple of slides is just one other case to highlight some of the other coupling methods in salts for foam as well. So this is pressure pulse, this water hammer test case. So it's a pipe where you apply a pressure at the inlet uh, for a set time period, and then a pressure pulse travels down the pipe. So even if you have an incompressible fluid solver, you still get a pressure pulse because of the solid uh, has a pressure in it, and that makes a pressure uh, travel along at a finite speed into incompressible uh, fluid, which is kind of neat, if you ask me. But what people often do is they look at the displacement of this point A as this pressure pulse travels down the point. And just to give you some insight into the kind of results you might expect, I know pff, there's a load on this graph. So what I'm showing here is time step sensitivity. Big dots mean big time steps, little dots mean little time steps, and the two colors are first order and second order schemes. So if you follow the blue ones with me for a second with the little dots, this is a small time step with a second order backward uh, scheme. And you can see as we make the time steps bigger, you have a kind of second order behavior. The, the errors grow more than, more than doubling each time. Um, whereas if we use a first order Euler scheme, you can see here's the coarsest time step. And even with the finest mesh, uh, the third finest mesh will be more accurate with a second order scheme. So you get relatively, relatively complex motion for a simple case. So in solids for foam, there's Dirichlet Neumann coupling, but there's also an implementation of Robin and Neumann coupling as well. So this is, I guess, more of like an intrusive method. It's not so black box. You actually have to go in and start hacking your pimple algorithm to force things in the right direction at certain, certain moments. Um, so there's a paper from Tukovic on this. So for each of those, you can also use Atkins or IQN. So that's like four approaches, two by two. But also, we also ported a weakly compressible flow solver. So in the literature, there's, uh, people have shown that they get better convergence for partition methods and monolithic methods if you use a compressible flow solver rather than incompressible. Because if you like, imagine you're filling up a balloon, then a slight change in the volume of the internal domain causes a huge peak in stress because the volume has to be strongly enforced. So adding a bit of compressibility just makes things easier. So it's not like a full compressible solver, it's like weakly compressible, they call it. So then you could use weakly compressible with each of those approaches as well. So you could have eight different approaches then. So I'm just showing six of them here. So if I compare Dirichlet Neumann with Atkins or IQN ILS with incompressible versus with weakly compressible versus with the Robin Neumann with Atkins versus precise as IQ, INLS. And I don't know if you followed any of that, but there's different approaches being used here. There's six of them. So if I just tried them with the default settings, I got the same answer in all of them. So yay, that's good. Um, they're all basically working. If I looked at the number of iterations, um, I know these are kind of dense slides. So the three IQ and ILS methods are all down the bottom. So precise is the orange one. So it's um, as good as the, it's similar behavior for this test case. I'm not 
claiming this generalizes for this test case, it shows similar number of iterations and performance to the built-in IQN LS methods. In this case, these are Atkins. Atkins does not very well on this. Um, then I reduced the time step much smaller, and I reran this case. So the, the Robin approach did poorly in that, on that problem. But once the time step's small enough, the Robin method works really, uh, really well. So the IQN ILS methods are all around here again. But in this case, the Robin approach converges in, I think it was four, four outer iterations every time. So this is this intrusive approach. So if the time step's small enough, that method works. So uh, this is one direction I know Jelko, who has developed, Tukovic has developed a lot of the methods in solid form. He's kind of focusing on these, a lot of these more intrusive methods for coupling. And potentially that's where solid form sits because you can have tools like Precise can really focus on the partitioned methods, but like monolithic methods, I guess there's a kind of gap there for how you develop those. This isn't monolithic, but it's more like non-black box, I suppose. Um, yeah, okay. I probably went longer than I wanted to. Oh, not too bad. Um, so an outlook. So it's good to end with strong conclusions. <laughs> this is not one. Uh, precise and solid for foam may be useful for someone, dot, dot, question mark. Um, I'm certainly going to play with it, and people in my research group are going to play with it anyway. So even if nobody else uses it, I'm happy for you to use it as well. And um, future solid for foam developments is not going away. So I have a permanent position, yay. So that means I will continue to work on this, and I am happy to write grants. So I write lots of grants, and um, solid foam is definitely core to my research. So um, there's going, there are currently at least maybe eight PhD students working on it in Dublin with me who were working on some aspect, not solid for foam development, uh, but on some tool that will, I think I can fit into it. So maybe you guys can give some advice to precise team on how do I, how can I more closely link those so I don't have to do all the, the, the integration and maintenance. And yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. Or uh, maybe, uh, which questions do you have? <laughs> our comments, our criticisms. What do you mean? And if you could repeat the question in the mic. Um, for the overset approach, is it possible to do rotating bodies? Uh, yes. The good thing with overset, as opposed to like immersed boundary, is the messy, complicated stuff is not at the interface. It's not at the FSI interface. So precise doesn't see overset. It just, it's like, where is the interface? It's a normal interface. It doesn't change, it just moves. And then the solid solver doesn't see overset. So it's the overset pushes this complicated coupling away from the interface, and that's an internal mesh problem, basically. Versus immerse boundary, then it, the problem's at the interface. So that's an advantage of overset. Uh, I guess it's more complicated though because you can have multiple overset regions all overlapping and then I've done, done some simple testing with Interfoam without FSI. Sometimes mask goes missing in, <laughs> in cases if with the Overfoam implementation. If you put the thing in the wrong place, suddenly you get a, a sink in a cell. And it, for this case, it's fine. But if you have like your overset object overlapping the boundary of your domain or you have multiple overlapping. So can you do rotating? Yeah, you can do rotating. Yeah, you, you can. I haven't done it. As long as your solid formulation allows for large rotations. And then the mesh motion solver, you have multiple regions, and so you just make sure you have to have the appropriate boundary conditions available in your open form mesh motion solver for overset, if that answers your question. Next question. So to repeat the question, can solid for foam handle 2D, um, like reduced model kind of formulations like shells, plates, beams, membranes, etc. cetera? Um, the answer to many questions like this is yes, dot, dot, in theory. Um, so n no, if you want a, a working solution right now, no is the answer. Uh, but you, can, you might have noticed there is a tutorial on beams and plates. So, um, more of the proof of concept 
uh, I included some implementations using this. It's called a finite area framework. It's it's like finite volume generalized to 2D non-planar surfaces. There is there is a framework in op in some of the open forms to do that. So uh, there's a Kirchhoff love plate formulation I included that works. Um, beams. We do have beams. We actually have an active projects on beams, similar Reisner beams, so really generalized large strain beams. So maybe to do it offshore, like risers and stuff like that. And we have some projects on that at the moment. So that will make its way in. So initially, there's like codes like Mordine and stuff like that where we're looking at, or like Orcaflex, um, where we're looking at kind of similar functionality. So that will make it in. Uh, membrane shells at the moment, there's no ongoing projects with that. I know it'll work. It's just. Uh, finding time uh, to implement it, or um, yeah, but, uh, um, so that's not basically not generally uh, available. Ge probably, if you're looking for general functionality, it's it's missing. I would say. Next, well, maybe last question for now. Yes, Benjamin. Yeah, yeah, so the, probably the larger differences are with Foam Extend, which Foam Extend is really 90% of the code is like a really old version of Open Foam because it, like a tree, it's split, split very early. And then Herve, who's the main guy, he just focused on particularly state of the art developments, like a block couple solver and a finite area formulation and some other stuff like that. But then the whole core, he just leaves it as the old version. So uh, it's m most of the changes are with Foam Extend, but at least the good thing is Foam Extend doesn't update very often, so none of that changes. But now what we see with ESI and Foundation, now it's they're really, really starting to change how they write some of the, like they just get rid of the whatever the thermal physical models. I'm like, no, nope, that's not the way to do it. We're going to do it this way. So that, that's a bit of a pain. That now you're having a block of text, which is like, well, if you're this one, do this. So my current solution is, say like, Pimple foam is quite different in the three solvers, the high level. So I just have a pimple fluid.c and I just use include statements. I just say include almost copied and pasted the entire solver from one version in one file. And then a separate file, I have the ESI foundation and a separate file for the, for the foam extend one. So that makes it easier that when you're reading the code, you only have to read one and if you're not interested. But yeah, that's, that's a challenge. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what the, the Future foam extend is as well uh, when their last version was released and it's becoming more aligned with ESI. So I'm probably aligning more with ESI at the moment to make my life easier. Um, yep. Okay, maybe last question by David. And if uh, Ishan could uh, uh, come and start setting up. So there, there's no higher order methods. They're all, let's say, nominally second order. Everybody says open oh, second order, but it's nominally second order. It's not. It, I want to see it really being second order on a real case, but it's nominally. So these would be the same. So uh, yeah, if you want, you can set up here. Um, so higher order schemes can be done in finite volume, um, particularly if you follow like compressible flow solvers, like some of the NASA codes, they'll often have like third, fourth, fifth order final volume formulations, explicit formulations. So it can be done. You do it using larger stencils. It's a bit of pain for parallelization. Um, so yeah, one of my many grants has higher order final volume solid mechanics <laughs> in it. So hopefully you'll see more in the space. There has been t two papers in this area, uh, final volume solid mechanics in the last, well, ever. So. Um, so yeah, it's definitely more difficult, but there's less people working on it. So there's nothing, there's no major limitation. It's just a diff, you just have a larger st the stencil. You have a larger stencil in F F FE as well. It's just, it's an internal stencil. So I guess more people are looking at DG, discontinuous Galerican as, as a kind of compromise between fine and volume. But I, I think there's still an advantage because have you, if you've read a paper on discontinuous Galerican versus a paper on fine and volume, it's like a, a total different world of like the, depth and weight of mathematics to, um, before you get to numerics and discontinuous Galerican is quite heavy. It's not something you stumble into. Whereas finite volume is still just, we balance the flux, now we calculate using a problem instead of linear, it's still very uh, approachable. But that's, that's debatable. The mathematicians in the audience will say you're wrong. So.
thanks so much. Yeah, I'm happy to chat more on you after. All right. Tom. Thank you very much, Philip. So uh, I think we will have a nice break uh, afterwards with uh, many possibilities for questions.